And we are live. Hello, UK Crime Book Club. Trying to get Simon McLeave to behave and sit still. He's like having toddlers again. Sorry. Right. Let's uh, let's introduce you both. Um, Simon, let's start with you because you're right next to me. Tell us who you are, where you come from and what your book is. Okay. Uh, my name's Simon McLeave. I'm a... Uh, Crime thriller author, obviously, um, originally from South London, living in North Wales. And my last book or current book is The Dark Tide, which is set on Anglesey off the North Welsh coast. And Claire. Well, my name is Claire Allen and I'm a, a, was a journalist and then I wrote women's commercial fiction and then I turned to the dark side about five years ago and I've been publishing thrillers ever since. So. Um, this is my latest one, it's actually our UK publication is this Thursday, so it's really timely and it's called The Nurse and like me it's set in Derry, because I'm a proud Derry girl. Um, I was going to actually ask you both what, um, what made you turn to the dark side with crime because I, I nicked it off your Amazon page, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> And I thought I like that. I'm going to use that as a question yeah. tonight. <laughs> so, Simon, let's start with you. What drew you into writing crime? It's not, um, ni neither of you write cosy crime. Let's no, be clear to no. anyone watching. You are not cosy. No. And it is engaging and gripping and oh. rips your heart out while you read it. And I'm not happy with either of you, the emotions you've put me through. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, obviously, I'm thrilled. So... Um, yeah, swings around that. I think it's just, I, do you know what? I'm completely upset. I obviously, this is something I probably shouldn't admit in public, but I'm just obsessed with crime and I've been from the time I, think I can you're in walk. the right place to say that. We're all hmm. must be a bit obsessed. Yeah, I mean, from the time I could walk, I was like, everything I watched or read was a mystery, whether it was Enid Blyton or Ian Fleming or whatever it was on telly, the Sweeney. I, I just kind of like everything I ever watched and read from ever has been crime so I wouldn't even know where to start writing anything else um you did yeah. write uh, one of my favorite things that isn't, um, oh, isn't yeah. crime. cave girl <laughs> <laughs> it makes me really giddy thinking about it you oh, still love watching oh. that with the kids my husband used to call me cave girl because I was always out in the garden with nothing on my feet oh. so, so I was cave girl not in so, quite such a fancy outfit though <laughs> Claire, how about you? Well, I am completely like the opposite, really, of Simon. I didn't really um, have an interest in crime and I didn't read crime. Mm. Um, you know, have myself a wee slap for that. But I was a journalist, so I was sitting in, you know, the magistrate's court in the crime court nearly every day of my work and life or standing at actual crime scenes and engaging with police and stuff. So mm -hmm. I suppose I have an excuse for wanting to completely distract myself from that when I got home from work at the end of the day. How I got into writing crime was completely by accident. I had written about 30,000 words of what I thought would just be another women's fiction novel, but it was a little bit heavier maybe than anything I'd written before. And I met with an editor and she went, do you know what? I think this would make a really good thriller. And she said, just give yourself permission to unleash your dark side. And that was the exact word she used. Mm -hmm. And I sort of went away going, I don't think I have the dark side. I just like writing about nice things and people falling in love and whatever else. But the more I thought about it, the more excited I got about it. And when I sat down to write it, I just loved it. I loved the whole process. I love that you're putting puzzles together and that's, the whole thing it's it's like solving your very own jigsaw puzzle every time you sit down to write a new book so i fell into it really accidentally but i'm really glad that it did because it's the most rewarding thing that i write so tell us a little bit both of you about the current book so the dark tide and the nurse so simon do you want to go first you uh, start, so new series for you new you series new characters not, yeah but not a million miles away from the snowdonia killings mm. uh, which i think was the idea um, basically, Laura Hart is, well, she was the chief negotiator in Manchester for the Manchester Met. Um, and something goes horribly wrong. Her husband, who was a uniformed copper, dies. Um, and so she picks up, she picks up the pieces of her life. She takes her two kids back to Anglesey, where she's from, where she was mm. born and bred, to rebuild her life. And she quits the police. 
Um, and uh, while she's there, there is a hijacking on one of the tourist ferries that goes over to Puffin Island, which had taken uh, by ac sort of accidentally taken hostage uh, by some a drug gang. Um, and they ask her if she can help negotiate the release of the hostages. And she's she won't she has PTSD. She doesn't want to go back. Um, however, she finds out that her son, her 11 year old son, Jake, is on a school trip on the ferry. So now she has to decide, will she will she go and kind of get past the PTSD, negotiate his release? Um, and that's how it starts off. And then it's a sort of roller coaster ride through that, really. Claire, tell us about the nurse. That's a tough one, a tough mm. one to follow. So the nurse, um, the title of the nurse maybe doesn't give away too much about this story, but it opens, we have um, a, a girl who is a nurse who has gone missing. She's 23 years old and her housemate phones her mum and says, have you been in touch with Nell? The mum hasn't spoken to her in a few days. 23 year old out living her life, having fun, but turns out she's been missing for four days when we start. And then we see a perspective from a mysterious character who's known only as him. And he is a kind of very disillusioned young man, um, feels rejected, doesn't really fit in, socially awkward. And he sort of gets drawn into the incel movement, which is the involuntary celibate movement and um, really sort of an, an online forum for misogyny. And things escalate. So we sort of see him from a few weeks before Nell goes missing, building up to, to the day she disappears. Whereas we see Nell and her mother from, from that point on. So you don't know who he is. You don't know what he's at. And you don't know if Nell's alive or dead. And um, yeah, it, it, it looks at all that really scary, scary stuff that goes on with, with men online at the moment. Mm -hmm. You've actually both got, and um, I quite like that they're very, very different, something in the opening of the book. So just before the book starts, um, Simon, you're explaining the meaning of a word, which mm. I'm not going to try and pronounce. And Claire, you've got something from um, a, a real incel page on Facebook. Yeah. Can I ask you both to read those out? I've not given you any warning. You can completely refuse. But they're so interesting and uh -huh. so different for something at the beginning of a book so um, on, I'm ready to go if, that, if that's okay if I go first yeah, go for Claire, yeah. so this did this went viral on um Twitter um people were sharing this post and it's from a genuine incel forum and it first went viral in February 2018 so this anonymous uh man posted the feeling when you follow a girl and she notices you and you try to lose you and she tries to lose you or picks up the pace. That is kind of a good feeling. You become important to her. You're no longer some random insignificant face in the crowd. I know it's kind of low level behavior, but I do enjoy doing that. I go to another city, look for a girl who is walking by herself and start following her. After a while, they notice you. After dark, after sunset, it may suffice to just walk in the same general direction as the girl who is walking in front of you. They become paranoid. I recommend you lonely incels try it sometime, just to make her afraid. If you know your limits and don't actually harass, let alone rape that girl, it should be harmless psychological fun. Jesus. I know. Mm -hmm. When I realised that that was real, We've lost Sam again. We have lost Sam again. Is she coming back? Oh. We could get you to read your. I can read. Yes, I can your, read your piece. Okay. I'll read my piece. Uh, Anglesey. There is a word in Welsh that has no exact translation into English. Hyriath. It is best defined as the bond you feel with a place, a mixture of pride, homesickness and a determination to return. Most people that have vis visited Anglesey leave with an understanding of Hyriath. So that's my, that's the beginning of my book. Um, What's the connection um, with Anglesey? And you, you're living in Anglesey now, are you? No, I live no. in North Wales. Near so I've visited Anglesey a lot. Yeah. Um, 
So it's um, it's just a special place, and it's got a special feeling to it. And it's very different to Snowdonia. Snowdonia's got a completely different atmosphere to it. Um, mm -hmm. But Anglesey is, is different. And, um, yeah, you know, I've got something. There's just something compelling about it, isn't it? It's the geography of it as well as the... the because it's an building. island as well. It's got the kind yeah. of... It's, it's, and it's quite small, so it's surrounded by sea. Um, it's... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, it's it's a special place. So I think. Hi, Sam. Hi, can you hear me and see me? We can. can. Okay, I've no idea. I've not used this camera on myself before. This is normally my in-person cool. live, but I'm a bit, what I'm a bit like a beat on it. <laughs> <laughs> but that's fine. Um, thank you that. for carrying on. That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> so. Let's come back to you first, Claire. So the it that must have been quite a harrowing thing. You read that, and then was there any trepidation with putting that in your book, or did you just think it was a really important thing? I thought it was really important to show that it, that it's real. That the things that I'm writing about in the book are really happening. It's not just you know um, me letting the, my crimey head run off with itself. This is this is actually what people are posting about and actually it's very very tame compared to um a lot of the stuff that's online because obviously did a, a, a bit of a digger deep or a deep a digger deep i can't even speak deeper tonight, dig. a deeper dig into the world of uncells um when i was researching the book and uh, some of the stuff is horrific so i thought it was important to, to put that in context and to let people know that this is this is this is real and people believe this and actually a lot of people were saying that's a brilliant idea. I'm mm. going to do that. I'm going to give it a go. And 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 in the book, the character, he does this quite by accident. He's walking home and he notices you know, that somebody is a bit intimidated by him and he gets a sense of power from it. He's feeling quite powerless in his own life. Um, and then so he, he sort of becomes that person that goes, try it and see how, how it feels. But of course, once you put something online, it's out of your control and it can escalate and it can move on from there so I just thought it was very interesting um and terrifying absolutely terrifying yeah really really creepy stuff I mean it's one thing when you know it's come from the author's imagination mm -hmm. but yeah some of the some of the things and people out there are... yeah yeah and a lot of the forum posts that I have used in the in the book are things that I have read people say in incel forums and a lot of the usernames that I have assigned in the book are real usernames so they're I wouldn't even say them in a live they're, they're that yeah. revolting so I really wanted to reflect the reality of it um but yeah it's it's a, it's a scary world and and the fact is there are thousands of people when you go into these forums the number of people having this conversation um yeah it's 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 a scary it's time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to you. Sorry, go on, Simon. Right. Sorry, Claire. Just to, did you find there was any kind of backlash or any kind of reaction from those types of people to your book? Do you know, I was kind of expecting there to be, but there hasn't been yet. Okay. Um, the UK releases is, is hitting this week. So it's been out in ebook and it's been out in right. Ireland, and there's been a really brilliant response to it. I have had a few people say they actually just couldn't read it. It was too yeah. um, on the nose. You know, we're aware of there's some very high profile cases recently. There's been a case in Ireland. There's been Sarah Everard. There's been these yes. things that, that are, it is quite close to. Um, mm -hmm. So I can understand why people wouldn't want to read it. But obviously the fear is somebody's going to get a hold of this and I'm, I will hear something from somebody down the line. Hasn't happened yeah. yet. And I just keep my fingers crossed and keep my Twitter account well um security security yeah, sure. threat at all times yeah yeah okay so moving on to yours <clears throat> excuse me simon um I'm, i missed you reading it out so tell me how to pronounce the word so i don't get it wrong because we know i will here we are here we are okay so yeah i was completely wrong about how to pronounce it but what a lovely thing so is that have you visited angle city rights you know for the research yeah, yeah. And is that how you felt? Yeah, I don't know why, because it's really strange, because I, I was saying to Claire that um, Snowdonia has like a real atmosphere to it, but it's quite kind of, 
mm. ominous and dark and it's got all that kind of celtic and arthurian legends and it's kind of very dramatic it's like you know the mountains and and then anglesey's kind of tamer but it's got a sort of really special feel to it and because it's surrounded by water and it and because a lot of it looks over towards the sort of welsh mainland you've got lots of water and then you've got the kind of snow dairy in the background it's it's just beautiful and very peaceful and tranquil and it's got something about it that's, that's very different um but i had them because <laughs> it's you know i said that it's a set on the siege was set on puffin on a on a cruiser boat and of course mm -hmm. i had then i had to realize that i said to my wife i haven't actually been on one of these yet so before i wrote the book i had to kind of we had to whiz off obviously mm -hmm. for research purposes to go onto a, a tourist boat and I spent most of the tourist of their time looking around to see where people could hide or where the lifeboats were. And I'm just <laughs> getting very <laughs> so why are you not looking at Puffin Island? And I'm kind of searching around for all these different things that I can use in the book. Um so um I find some... I do that everywhere I go. It's like, yeah. okay, you could you could find a body there and you could do this yeah, here. Yeah. My family, no, I don't like going anywhere with me. My kids <laughs> love it. Just it again. My kids love it. If we're out in the car somewhere, um, or if I'm on the train, they'll be saying to me, they'll be messaging saying, have you seen anywhere good yet? Which is, you know, probably uh, wrong, but mm -hmm. we, we have a lot of fun planning things. Yeah. Fake, fake things. Fake and, things. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. I can't get used to this camera at all, and I don't even know. I've got two, and I don't even know which one I'm on, I'm on so I'm leaving it alone. Uh -huh. um, we've got some... <laughs> <laughs> the first comment that I saw then was from Aggie Sam, MIA. Yeah, I did disappear, but I'm back, Aggie. <laughs> um, so we've got a few hellos from lots of people. And Jane Risden, greetings all. Congrats on being here. Good luck with your writing. Um, Leslie Lloyd listens to Dark Tide on audiobooks. So tell us what you thought, oh, Leslie. Yeah. And then you've got me, Simon, please read yours. So anyone tuning in and hearing me read that out will have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> So, um, David Monaghan Jones moves to Anglesey in two weeks. Oh, lucky man! I know that's gone fast. I'm sure it feels like it should be further away. That's unless the house moves been moved up. I'm not sure. Um, Megan Barstow, hello, Megan, listening from T uh, Tasmania. Oh wow, well, hi, Megan. So, I never know what time it is. Whenever, um, whenever Megan comes in to to uh, watch an interview, it's always some ridiculous o'clock mm -hmm. where she is. So. Hello, Megan. Um, oh, and Leslie enjoyed it, the yeah. audio book. Um, David says, I went on the puffin steamer to Puffin Island, and after we set off, they only told us then there was no puffins at that time of year. That's just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think. <laughs> Wait you got your money, and then actually there's no puffins. The false advertising. Uh -huh. I went to Belfast Zoo once, and like I think nearly every animal enclosure was closed. You're just walking about looking at empty things and like <laughs> not the best day. Eh? So I want to ask you both about your main characters in your book. So I want to know, did they did you have a firm idea of them before you started? And did they change a lot in the writing process? So who wants hmm. to go first? Well, I am... Um, I'll jump in. Sorry, Simon. It's, okay, okay. it's fine. Give um, him a minute to think. He's good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the character, the, there are three POVs in the book, and the two main characters that are that really lead the story are Marion, who is Nell's mother, and him. I had their voice in my head, um, and I think only other writers really get this and I always feel a bit weird when I'm saying it but sometimes it's just like this character arrives in your head and their voice is so clear and you know straight away that that you just have to sit down and the words are going to come it doesn't happen with every book by any means some books you're dragging the words out of them but with this book the two voices were there um really strongly from the start and I try not to plan too much. I try not to tie my characters down too much because the more I write, the think the more you get to know them, and the real, the more real they become. So, three quarters in their book or something, you could go, well, that character wouldn't actually react the way that you first planned that they would. And I love that when a character can surprise me as a writer. So I always like to stay open for that. Um, it was definitely a challenge to write. 
an incel um, mm. because ultimately you have to be invested in the characters that you're writing and he, he's really, you know, not the nicest of people. Um, but I hope that when readers read him, they understand how he's got into it and they have some sort of understanding, if not sympathy for him. So that was a challenge um, and to have him say certain things that are so completely repulsive mm. um, was definitely tough as a woman to sit down and do that. But that's that's why we do it though, we, we're telling stories and, um, and I love it. And the two characters were an absolute joy to write all in all. They were just, it was, that book was just one of those, you get it every like maybe four or five books when you just sit down and you just go, and it just spills onto the page. The one that followed it has been a nightmare. That's any consolation. <laughs> it's still in case. We'll ask you about that one in a minute. Yeah, um, Simon. That's absolutely, yeah, exactly what Claire said. It's that. Um, I, I, yeah, I didn't. Pl I didn't plan the 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 dark tide too much. I sort of knew who Laura was. We had four POVs in it. Um, two of them are sort of subplots, but um, it was like Laura and Gareth. Um, and but Laura kind of knew almost the, from the beginning what she was like I kind of had an idea and it's sort of yeah she writes herself almost from the beginning um Gareth less so and then as Gareth kind of developed he started doing stuff that I didn't expect or I went oh my god he's I just thought of some I, I thought there's something in the second book which I can't tell you but he does something you're thinking it, it feels like it's right but it's it's not great <laughs> you just go oh Gareth, <laughs> what that for? um but it felt but you know what I mean as you Claire was saying it's, they kind of take you in places and you think yes that feels right but um yeah they sort of write yourself and certainly in my other series I mean the, the, the two main characters in my other series are completely real in my head they exist they are people and I know everything about them from the time they were born till now and how they would react mm -hmm. in any situation um and that's the that's the fun of writing is it's a, it's How do you let go of characters then after writing so many in a series? Because I struggle to let go after writing a standalone. So I don't I know how to move on. No, I, I'm now writing book twelve, so oh, I'm so I've just gone back to it. I don't. Yeah, I, I couldn't even. Oh God, I don't even think about not mm -hmm. writing. Room. <laughs> so you get a wee bit emotional there, Simon. Yeah, no, I couldn't. I couldn't even imagine not writing those books. Um, and I know that. I mean, I've killed off a couple of main characters, and even that one of them I was. I came out. Of Don't name the character. Do not I spoil went, went, anything. I had tears <laughs> in my eyes. My my wife went, "You're right," and I went, and then I told her what had happened, and it was. I suppose I must have been invested in it because I was crying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but I assume that came across in the writing. I think, hopefully. Because uh, she was, or well, she or he was, were, were gone, was gone. I won't say anything now. Um, Claire, you touched on the book that you're working on at the moment being a bit of a nightmare. So, how far into it are you? I have submitted it to my editor, and I'm Ooh. waiting for the structural edits to come back at any time. So, it's that really nerve wracking stage where you're like wanting your email inbox to go but not wanting it to go at the same time so um it's with every book i try and and do something completely different i suppose and and push myself more and more as a writer and i think with this one there are just so many twists and threads coming together and by the end of writing the book i'm not sure if i tied them all together right if i have pulled it off it's going to be the best book i've ever done but have I pulled it off? I don't know. I'm too close to it. I need somebody else now to look at it and go, yeah, you, you've done it. But um, I, yeah, I think just every few books as well as you get, you get a book that's a joy. Every few books you get one that is a complete struggle. And it does generally tend or tend to be something that you end up being really, really proud of and that, and then gets a good response and does push you further as a writer. But Oh my God, I could have very easily thrown the computer out the window <laughs> several times. And I had so many pages with all the different strands and lines between them. It was like one of those serial killer walls that you see in, in TV <laughs> things. It was it was tough going, but um, fingers crossed. 
in our, I don't want to say too much because no, then I can tell you what the plot is and then, and then it changes. Year, the book comes out for me because that one hasn't worked. You'd be like, see, she, she didn't get it right. She messed up. So. <laughs> no, keep it mysterious. Keep and it then fun. you can be like, next year, no matter what, you'll be able to say to us, no, it was exactly what I went with. That's that was it. the book yeah. I submitted. That's what mm -hmm. came out. Editor didn't need to touch it. It was fine. Not a thing. It was Not great. a thing. Uh -huh. Simon, I've seen that the next book in the series is um, up for pre-order, or is it just the title, the cover that's, is it just the book that's, my words will not come. It's so I've there. noticed it's that there's something up on Amazon. Is it available for pre-order yet? It is. The second book, In Too Deep, is available for pre-order. Um, I've done a first draft and now I'm, I'm meant to be completing a second draft by Tuesday. So a week. Um, I was going to say, so not today then. I'm not keeping you from writing. No. Um, <laughs> so yeah, no, it's okay. I think it's. I think it was interesting what Claire was saying because on this second book, I've kind of thrown everything at it. Um, I got the dreaded phrase: "There is some heavy lifting to do," um, which, <laughs> which is a polite way of saying, "Yeah, this needs a bit of work." Mm -hmm. um, and as a writer, you sort of want the editor to come back and say, "Absolutely." be brilliant first draft you don't need to do anything but actually when i spoke to my editor and kind of got all the notes i kind of thought well that's really good because this will make the book 10 times better and it's really pushed me as a writer um yeah and there's like storylines there's historic stuff there's stuff in ireland um yeah it's all kind of it's it's very different to the first book it's much more of a mystery than it is a kind of thriller but i enjoyed writing it um, we'll see. Hopefully, the the second draft's okay. Touch wood. It will be because it will have all that input from from your editor. And I know sometimes when we get our notes in and you first read them and you just want to cry and you think, oh God, this is so hard. But then when you sit down and turn the ego off and read it, you realise, like Simon says, it makes the book so much, so much better because there's somebody coming in that knows the yeah, history nice. and. Fresh eyes, yeah. Yeah, I, I resent my editor for about 24 hours and then I realised that everything she said... <laughs> exactly, actually, yeah. Like, and actually, she came up with some brilliant ideas that I went, oh, my God, that is fantastic. And then I went yeah. back to her and she went... And we just had a brilliant phone call. So I kind of go, actually, do you know what? She does yeah. know what she's doing and she's it brilliant. It always <laughs> helps to have sort of that wee bit of creative back and forth. I think no matter what you're, mm. you're working in, and you will pull something bigger and better but by the time we have slaved over a first draft and put our heart and soul into it I think it's like sending your child into school on the first day and hoping that everybody plays with it it's, it's like a... please please like this and so it's a bit tough when you hear that your child is the is the one sitting in the corner eating the chalk like you know it is and I think the sec I found the second draft because I've done so much work on it what you end up doing is sort of losing sight of who knows what, when, and how, because I'm moving backwards and forwards between storylines and backwards and forwards through the book. So mm -hmm. you end up having a, a briefing scene and you're thinking, oh God, I've got to go all the way back and work out what do they what do they know? Mm -hmm. What do they know? What do they need to find out? And it kind of, it kind of melts your brain. Um, but what's great mm -hmm. is then I've got someone else that can read it and go, actually that scene doesn't work because, um, but yeah, no, we'll, we'll get there. I've just noticed Megan said it's 4 a.m. Oh. Megan, you are a committed oh, reader, or is or is it that you've got young kids and that is the only time you get any peace? Been there. Probably. Mine are that bit older now. Hang yeah. in there if that is the reason you're oh, up on God. your own at four in the morning. <laughs> um, you're up in four, at four in the morning waiting for them to come in when they're a bit older is the problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've started that with one of mine this year. It's fun. Mm -hmm. It's really oh, fun. Oh, God. Um, Kaz has asked, what's the most interesting research rabbit hole you've been down? So, I mean, I'm the kind of person who can, I will see a tweet and then I'll think, oh, I don't recognise that person or I recognise mm -hmm. their name. I'll go and have a look who they are. I didn't know that had happened to them. And like three hours later, I know the ins and outs of everything. And I think, why, why have I just read all of that? So, I did go. This... I went on a bit of a. I mean, this is kind of like an extended rabbit hole. When I, I read my third book in the Snowdonia Killings was about a serial killer, and I decided that I wanted to make the serial killer as 
authentic as I could, rather than having it sort of slightly, I don't know, stereotypical, cliched. So I read all around Dennis Nielsen and some of the, um, but I kind of went <laughs> kind of a bit carried away and sort of read, read and watched everything I could find um, to create the character. And I sort of found myself kind of spending way too much time doing it, which kind of says quite a lot about my mind. But um, hopefully it worked. Uh, to me, I kind of went, I'm not sure how much I actually used of that research and how much was just me kind of being more and more fascinated by what I was reading. So there's a bit of, it was a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. It's probably the incel stuff for me, um, mm. to be honest, because once you start going down that particular um, tunnel, you could be there for yeah. hours. A lot of Reddit used to have incel boards that were open and public and on, on you know, the the um, the main internet, and they closed them down. I think about four years ago, after there'd been a mass shooting in America, and. Um, but all those boards are still available, like archived, you can see them, you still have access. So you have pages and pages and pages of this stuff. And you find yourself reading the threads and clicking on a username and following them and trying to get a real feel of a personality. And um, then, you know, you, you find yourself slipping into blog posts and people linking stuff from the dark web. And, mm. you know, it's it's grim, but it's absolutely compelling as yeah. a research topic like it's it's hard to look away from it so um but yeah it would be nice to do like a bit of sort of brain bleach now and forget some of it but yeah we, well, we can, writers carry a lot in our heads i can safely say i'm not going down a rabbit hole on either of the two things you two have just said <laughs> I, I was offered an interview with um a doctor who became friends with dennis nelson and oh, wow. Um, who wrote a book and we, we discussed it in the book club and decided that we are definitely not veering into true crime so um, I had to send a grovelling email back apologising and saying really sorry but this isn't for us so I, I, I did start the book I didn't get very far into it yeah I just I put it down and went back into fiction yeah much more my thing <laughs> but honestly, like, because people say that we write really, you know, disturbing stuff, and obviously we do write really disturbing things because mm. that's what we're writing. But it's nothing compared to what's happening in in the real world, and um, that's why writing. People say, "Me, how can you write that? How can you allow that into your brain?" I'm like, because it's made up, and I'm controlling it, mm. and it's safe, Very and it's different. a way to explore the darker side of work. Whereas when I was working as a journalist, I might be sitting in court cases, and I'd be hearing absolutely horrific stuff that was so horrific we would never have reported it in the paper um mm -hmm. it wouldn't have been in the public interest the level of detail that you heard um and that's you know that's real that's scary that's what the scary thing is going home and making up a story where ultimately the great thing about writing crime is that the bad guys get their comeuppance normally yeah. um, and the good people when you don't always get that in real life so it's it's much easier to stay in the fiction side of things. I wouldn't be like a true crime addict at all, probably for the mm. same reasons. It's, it, it's too real, it's too terrifying. Yeah, I did start down the path of it with the job that I had. And once I left the job, I, I didn't continue with the true crime, which just shows where my actual fascination lies. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm, I'm oh. much happier with um, inside your heads than inside yeah in fact speaking of being in your heads we're having a quick conversation just before we came live and I'm just going to ask about <laughs> one of the things that we talked about we're not going into everything we've discussed um, I'm going to ask about cold water swimming is that the word is it sea swimming cold well cold water dipping is more what, okay. what we do but um, only because I'm really like nervous around the water and I'm, I'm really intimidated by the sea but it's absolutely the best thing that you can do for your mental health once you get through the barrier of actually walking into the sea in you know the start of March when it's um snowing it's it's just I'm sorry snowing snowing or raining actually it's lovely to cold water dip when it's raining it's really I can imagine really that nice. being nice but the yeah. snow yeah 
I'm okay with anything as long as the water's not too stormy, it's not too wavy, because that's a bit scary. Um, but yeah, it, it's, I don't know, there, I think the, the appeal of it is a bit like every time it's mind over matter. So you have to kind of force yourself to go in every time. It's not like, it doesn't get easier. You know, you are going on that cold water and feeling it and getting down, we get down to the water's shoulder level. Um, so you feel that sense of achievement that you've actually felt the fear and done it anyway, but it also, there's lots of science and it releases all the happy hormones and balances serotonin and, um, and it like has lots of, um, physiological benefits too. So it can like, um, uh, stall inflammatory processes and, and it actually helps with menopause and hot flushes too. So, um, um good, uh, well, when, sometimes. when off dementia and stuff as well isn't it yeah it is it's all the science behind it is is completely Incredible. fascinating and um yeah anything that sort of helps and i have fibromyalgia so i would have flare-ups quite often but since i've been dipping if i feel a wee flare-up coming on i go and get in the sea and normally cold would make it so much worse but whatever it is it just stops the flare in its tracks mm. and it doesn't get any worse so i'm able to carry on so Maybe it could be psychological. I don't know, but it's working. So um, I recommend so it. So let's not it, overthink it if it's working. Exactly. It doesn't help that I live by you know, the Donegal coast. So it's absolutely beautiful too. And I think there's something about being in nature. It's like you're talking about Anglesey being such a lovely, magical place. It's, mm. it's somewhere where it's just sort of raw and the sea and the, and the landscape. There's something really healing about that in it too. Leslie's asked the same question that Simon asked you before we went live. Wetsuits, question mark? No, no, we so don't I, do wet. I, I, we don't do wetsuits in, in, uh, in the North of Ireland. We're hardcore. Mm. Um, no, we, um, we, we wear the neoprene shoes, so like the wetsuit shoes and gloves. And we do wear swimsuits as well, <laughs> because it's like we're just wearing the gloves and shoes. And we go in. <laughs> the less you can wear, the more benefit you get from it. Apparently, there is somebody in our group that goes in in a bikini. Okay. And I'm like, you're brave. That that will not be happening for me anytime. That cold on your stomach. I'm not sure that. Every time the water hits your stomach or that area when you're walking in, it's like every time. So, no. Mm. Bear tummy. No, it's not happening. But, I, I mean, I went yeah. on the, I, but I, I cheated because I went in with my son. It was, it was December. Uh, off the Welsh North Welsh coast, but we had we that had, is quite hardcore. We had wetsuits on. We did go under and got very kind of like our heads very cold and and fingers, but um, I don't think wets. Yeah, well, I, I when I posted it, I had people from London who I know that do it, and they just went, "You're cheating." So yeah, I feel like so, I've seen that photograph. I feel like we've talked about that photograph before, but I'm mm. not sure. I probably messaged you to say that you're absolutely mental, but you know. Yeah, I've done it yeah. a few times. <laughs> it is, it is a, like a wee form of insanity because when you think about it, you're walking into water that is, you know, maybe eight degrees or something. When if you're doing it at the start of the year, and that's 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 cold, mm. um, and you're doing it willingly, nobody's forcing you to do it, and <laughs> so um, there's a wee madness behind it, but obviously it has a benefit, so. Um, that's good. This time of year is a wee bit easier to do it because obviously the water's that wee bit warmer. We're up to a whole 13 degrees at the minute. Still too it's cold. My main character <laughs> in the dark type, that's what she's, she does. So yeah. Laura, the, 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 my main character, that's what, when she gets to Anglesey, she discovers the Blue Tits, who are a local swimming group who go cold water swimming. And so there's about three or four scenes in the first book where she goes into the sea. I've forgotten goes, that. I'm sorry. What a great name. <laughs> so I, mean, I think for research purposes, you really need to like, you know, go in without the wetsuit. And... I think I'm going to now. Yeah. Especially this time of year. I reckon I can get out. I can do yeah, it. This time of year is, is lovely. It definitely doesn't hit quite as as hard. But um, yeah. I know the men find it a bit more challenging at times than the women yeah. walking in, to say the least. But... Get over it. Yeah. Um, before we move on to the rest of the, oh, everyone's kind of um, having having a chat, but we'll we'll go back to that in a second. Um, so, series versus standalone. 
why did why have you made the choices that you've made in what you've written so simon you've um stuck to series and you're continuing to do so any uh, standalones in the pipeline uh I'm talking to one publisher about a standalone, but I, I just think I have no idea when I have time to write it. So, um, and when I first started, I was just it was just because I went down the indie publishing route when I first started, and I everything every person I looked at or every person I asked and every course I went on just went write a series because mm -hmm. that's the only way to make money and to get people reading your books. So I just followed their advice. Um, and when Harper Collins came to me about the Anglesey series, they said we want a series. So, so so far it's kind of been um, that's the way it goes. I would like to rock a stand. I would, yeah, at some point I'd like to give that a go. Good, Claire. Any plans for series at all? Do you know, I would love to. I always thought there's a character in my last book, Ingrid Devon. She appears on and off in like minor roles through a number of books and I have a number of characters who are like wee cameos and they come in and out. I think there's probably a bit of scope for a series with her. Um, she's a journalist and she's like not the most ethical journalist, but she gets the story. Um, and But the danger with that is everybody goes, oh, that's just you when you were a journalist then and I know who you're writing about. It's not, she's completely fictitious. But I think, no, I need a fresh challenge each time, even if it can be hard to find that really fresh storyline and fresh cast of characters. Because um, I, I would fear that I would just end up writing the same book over and over again and slightly, you know, colour it in a wee bit differently. Um, but I completely admire people who write series and write them so well, like um, Helen Fields and Jane Casey and people like that. They're writing like, oh, I'm... I, completely obsessed with their books I would feel that, that that would be a really tough act for me to try and follow when they do it so well and I'm not sure I would mm. I'm sure you would I'm sure you'd be fine um I've actually I've received a book today that I'd ordered from Amazon um a long way from home behind me by Brian Caves um and there isn't a second, it is going to be a series. There is a second book in the works and I'm really excited about it. So it isn't my usual kind of book. Um, didn't stop me being absolutely smitten with it. It's just, I've, I've read it, I don't know, a few times now. I absolutely love it. So um, I thought I'd pop it behind me because I have got your books, but they're mainly on Kindle. So this is the thing, because I, I get sent a lot of books and I buy an awful lot of books. A lot of it is now on my Kindle because you can't really see my office, but the, the, it's <laughs> small book. and yeah. there's just piles of books upon piles of books everywhere. So um, Kaz also asked, leading nicely onto that, what have your top reads of the year been so far? Oh, goodness. Do you That's read crime book. when you're writing crime, firstly? Yeah. I, I do. Um, sometimes I have to, if, if I'm like coming up to a deadline or coming up to the end of a book, I have to like, not mm -hmm. because I find that I am a magpie and I will find myself slipping into other people's voices maybe a wee bit if there's an, a writer I really admire from reading one of their books then I'm like picking up wee elements of their writing style so I have to shift away when I notice that happening but I think I generally always have two books on the go um an audio book and a, a proper book um and one of those at least one of those will be crime um I'm actually listening to um jack jordan's do no harm oh. at the moment and that has me like doing extra housework and stuff just so i can keep <laughs> listening to it so um, <laughs> it's it's really good it's different to what i thought it was going to be um the concept caught me with that one um but probably the best book that i have read this year is um Helen Fields, One for Sorrow, and let's go back to that series thing. Yeah. Oh, she's that's, why I, that's why I just picked up. That's so weird. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she's just she's an amazing <laughs> storyteller, and that book I think is you know it's the the latest in a series, but it just takes it next level, and, and I'm so invested in the characters, and she can't write them fast enough, as far as I'm concerned. It's like, come on, write <laughs> up. So that is just she's a phenomenal writer. She just gets it right. Well. Yeah. <laughs> 
that's another brilliant one. Adam Fields fan club. <laughs> it really is, you know, because I'm I'm reading her new one at the minute as well, The Last Girl to Die, which is out, I think, it's August or September, and it's brilliant. So she can, can't write anything bad, in my opinion. Like Everything that I've picked up from her, I know that I'm going to get a really good story. She's phenomenal. Oh, she's great. How funny that you both had the same book in mind. I know. <laughs> but it, it just it, goes it, to show it, it appeals to everyone. Good. Yeah, it is that good. And I think you could even, you would benefit from having read the series, but you could pick it up as a standalone and yeah. still get an awful lot from it. It's just, again, it kind of looks at, I suppose, toxic masculinity and violence against women and all sorts of things. But I think when she writes her bad guys, she completely... She horrifies me, the stuff that that woman makes up on her mind. Like, it's it's so... <laughs> dark. It, it's so dark. And there's times I have literally been listening to it or reading it and going, oh, my God, that really jaw-dropper. But it's totally, totally believable. You never feel as if she's gone too far. It's just you're oh. there and you're with the character. So so I feel like I should... This would be the first meeting of the Helen Fields fan club here. But, um, <laughs> yeah, she's just, just great. Leslie's actually messaged me, I'm sure, about Helen asking if I can um, get her in for an interview. I feel like I should get her in with you two, and you two would be able to grill her about yeah, her books and yeah. talk it's about the characters. Boy, oh, she's so, lo <laughs> she's so lovely too. She would be lovely. She would love the chat. Thing I was just, the, on, um, just on a panel at Crime Fest with her, so, and she was brilliant. She was so nice. Yeah, no, yeah. She's a, she was a, a good person. We should talk about things that you've been up to, because now that everything's kind of you know there's more movement i know it's not all we're not pretending it's all gone away and mm -hmm. um but th there's definitely more movement there's more things happening now so what have you both been up to and what are your plans for the rest of the year are you attending any events have you got book signings are you going to see some author at an event simon let's go to you first um yeah no, it's been great and also i think as an indie writer now having a sister a, a, a series with a trad publisher I get to do all that stuff which I didn't get to do as an indie writer so I did the crime fest and I um I did some books I went I whizzed around all the water stones in Wales signing books so that was really nice um and then I'm going to do the Wimbledon lit fest next Tuesday and doing uh, bloody Scotland and something else I think that's it at the moment but yeah bits and bobs it's been fun it's been quite nice just to get out there and meet other authors and meet readers and all that kind of thing um yeah, it can be a bit of a whirlwind really so uh, we really only started things kicking off again here in in ireland very recently so this month has been like a bit of a, a um a reinvention it suddenly started going to things again and doing things so um uh, I'm doing Belfast Book Festival next week and then we have a book festival down here in Derry the week after. I'm going to book clubs to talk to them about the book. Doing quite a few online events actually, which is brilliant to see that they're still happening even now that things are a bit more opened up because obviously not everybody can travel um, and get around to events. Yeah. And I'm up here in like, you know, the northwest coast of Ireland. It's not always easy to, to get to things. Um, so it makes it brilliant for me as an author to be able to sit in my office like I'm doing now and chat to people and be a part of an event mm. and chat to readers that way and meet other authors that way. So, Yeah, we definitely decided that we would keep doing interviews because there were so many people that messaged myself, Kaz, the other admins, saying just how much they'd enjoyed it and yeah. they maybe don't get out a lot and this made it easier for them. So... We love that. And plus, I've not got people sat in front of me. I've just got you two. So when mm -hmm. I go and do my first oh first live in-person events hosting on Saturday in Wigan, and oh. I am mm -hmm. a little oh, nervous because I'll actually be able to see people. Yeah, well, it's it, either going to be splendid or splendidly bad, isn't it? I'm, I'm going to fall off the great. stage yeah, or something. It'll be great. It'll be one of those once you're there and it just sort of, takes over I, did, I was at a harper collins event in dublin two weeks ago and that was the first thing i've been to since before the pandemic wow so i really felt like i hadn't met anybody or been in a crowded room or whatever in like two and a half years and my nerves were in bits 
because it was like uh, meeting booksellers and meeting mm. media and so you're having to go around and be like I'm me I'm fabulous read my book mm. it was it was a wee bit strange you feel a bit more um at ease when you're sitting where we're most comfortable which is in our own wee offices where we sit and write and make things up and nobody bothers us <laughs> I should really go back to some of these um, actual questions Lindsay Lynn says her house is just piles of books mine too they come in really handy like we, we I wouldn't like put a drink on them or anything but I have balanced my camera on them before now and things like mm -hmm. that not nothing that would actually ruin the books other than they, they fall on my head occasionally um Leslie said the name made her chuckle too I think that's referring to your swimmers Simon yes yeah. indeed I'm not saying it I'm not I'm, saying it you already said it once oh okay <laughs> I'm going to say it again now. Oh, is it not shy now? <laughs> he has well. gone shy now. Um, Aggie's saying, come on, I'm not that scary. Aggie's actually going to the event on Saturday, so I get to meet her. Um, so Aggie wants to know, are you both writing full time or do you have other jobs? And what are your hobbies, obviously, besides killing people? Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> so, Claire, do you want to go first this time? I am writing full time now. Um, the exceptionally privileged to be able to do it because I wrote for 10 years while I was still working as a journalist and it was always the dream that someday hopefully I'd be able to do it full time um so yeah it's it's brilliant I work harder than I think I ever worked and I work longer hours um and that's what you have to do I suppose when you're when you're wanting to be a full-time writer very few people get to you know do this full time off the back of mm. you know writing a book a year or job and other things and trying other things so I'm doing a little bit of TV work and um bit of um writing in other genres and whatever else and I do it full time and it's brilliant it doesn't leave me an awful lot of time for hobbies bar the cold water dip in obviously and um and taking my wee dog out a walk um and yeah she's my baby so and then I've got two kids and I'm homeschooling one of them so you know that that keeps me busy I remember home, homeschooling not a fan and oh, I was a no. teaching assistant but oh. teaching your own kids no nope. mm -mm. so mm. hats off to you um big thumbs up for that because it's it's the best thing unless you're terrible at maths which I now am and I had to do a um, a math session with my high school age son i mm -hmm. i cried and found videos for him to watch yeah i think that's that's the way to do it youtube's brilliant or like bbc bite size or something like that for anything mathematical i don't have a, a brain for numbers at all i used yeah. to teach it in primary school but not high school i've no. not taught high it's, school maths. it's like a different language you know it, it is basically a line it's a language with numbers yeah. and it no it doesn't work for me and yeah, then all the, all the homeschooling, actually online stuff kicked in, so I didn't need to do it then. <laughs> yeah. We homeschool my 11-year-old, George. He's year seven. Um, he was too anxious to go back to school and mm. really suffered. So took him out. And, yeah, he's very good at maths. But we have mm -hmm. a math tutor because, actually, I he asked me the first few times and I just looked at him. I had no idea what he was talking about. So yeah. but, um, that, does keep us, that does keep us busy. Yeah. And I was thinking about the um, the anxiety side of it as well. I didn't realise, Claire, that you only really just started to be able to do things. You know, that's very, it's a bit longer than it's taken in England, yeah. for, obviously for various reasons. Uh -huh. But it is, it's an anxious thing. I've stuff for mm -hmm. quite a while after, mm. um, after England was unmasked. And um, it, it's quite intimidating because you've got used to it. And yeah. we've yeah. been loving a very sort of insular life and um, like Simon's son, my daughter experiences really bad anxiety. She's autistic and um, that's the reason we had to take her out of school. So we became even more sort of insular then. So yeah. going out into crowds, you, you have that sort of COVID fear in the background, but it's also just the social aspect of it because we've sort of forgotten how to be around people. Well, I have forgotten how to be around people in that sort of professional um yeah. way as you can tell by the fact that i can hardly form a sentence tonight 
No, it's just me. It's catchy. And I started that earlier on. But yeah, absolutely. People think I'm really kind of because I'm quite chatty and friendly and people yeah. think I'd be absolutely fine. I'm an anxious mess. So anyone who looks at me and thinks, oh, she's got it together. Simon will tell you I've not. Yeah, so. you've always been together. You're an old pro. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean say old, but you are a pro. You've been, how many of these have you done? A couple of hundred, probably. Yeah, maybe. Same. So you must be maybe not to... quite that much. I don't know. A few. We've yeah, done a, a few. Yeah. yeah. But going outside with people, that's quite different. So mm -hmm. yeah, completely get where your kids are coming from. And yeah. fair play to you for you know making sure that they're happy and homeschooled and safe. Thing, it's the it? only thing that matters at the end of, of course the day, it is. really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Happy. And we have three minutes left. Ooh. This always happens <laughs> when Mm. kind of just get into chatting about this and that and it feeds nicely <laughs> off each other barely looked at my questions i've just made stuff up as i've gone along and i think we've answered most of the ones um i'm just there are comments about homeschooling so i'll, I'll have a look at those afterwards but um give us a reminder of your books what formats they're in and where we can buy them Get those plugs in and show off as many book covers as you've, you've got with you. Okay, so that's The Dark Tide, available. We've got Amazon, Waterstone, Stumpy H. Smith's now, I think. Audio book, paperback, digital. So, yeah. So, everything and available everywhere. It is, yes. <laughs> Claire? This is The Nurse. And at the moment, if you went on tonight, you could get it in audiobook and the narrators are fantastic. Or you can get it in ebook. Or if you're in Ireland, you can buy this nice big trade paperback size. But from Thursday, you'll be able to get it um, throughout the UK and it's going to be in the big supermarket. We'd like to mention specific supermarkets. It's oh. going to be in Asda as is it? Karen Slaughter Killer Read Choice nice. of the Month, which wow. is brilliant. I know, isn't that oh amazing? God. So that's, um, that, that's a that's a cool Congratulations. one. I pick up the team Avon for, for pulling that one off. So um yeah, so from Thursday, pick it up with your shop and then as that. Amazing. Congratulations. That is fantastic. I'm gonna give you one of our favorite questions. And I've asked Simon this before, but you might have a different answer by now because it's been a while. Mm -hmm. Um and I like to finish with this one. So what have been your most memorable moments as an author so far? Ooh. I'll let either one of you dive in. I had a Zoom with Ian Rankin last week. Nice. And that was that was pretty amazing. He didn't know who I was, but it was still. <laughs> but I got to talk to him for half an hour about how he writes books, and he just I just picked his brains, and that was that was cool. And then at the end, he said, "I'll Google you and see exactly who you are." So that's the best thing that's happened to me recently. Yeah, if I'd have known, I'd have asked you to ask him if he'd come for an interview. Oh, exactly. No. <laughs> Surian, sorry. Oh, Honestly, Surian, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Probably my most surreal writer moment, as I said, like my background is writing commercial women's fiction. Um, so um just before I got the book deal with Harper Collins, um, I was in London meeting with an editor and Marion Keyes invited me to her 20th anniversary party for watermelon. So I'm like standing on this rooftop bar in central London with Marion Keys and all these like authors and celebs. And I was just there like the complete <laughs> person in the corner, just fangirling everybody. Yeah. Going, oh my God, look at this. And that was very, very surreal. And That's then, really cool. yes, did eating a, a pick and mix with Marion Keys at like half 10 at night. Sounds wow. That, that was kind of cool. Yeah. I, can't, I can't pick between those two. They are definitely answers we have not had before. And Marion Keys is um, her Twitter. Just, she cracks me up. Yeah, I think the just, woman wins Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how that's how she is in real life. That's just, that's just her. She's that worry and that quick and just, <laughs> and that lovely and that welcome and supportive of, of all her authors, um, which is great. Because, you know, not everybody, especially people that are really, really successful, they don't, have to share the love button. Mm. Brilliant. And on that note, thank you to everybody who's asked questions and come along thank to watch. And Megan, fair play to you getting up early for 
to yeah. come and see. That's fantastic. And thank you, more important, well, just as importantly, to you two for coming and joining me for an hour. I've absolutely loved every minute. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thanks, um, and thanks, Claire. Thank you.